Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Influence Change at Work show. I'm your host, Heather Stagel, coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia on Blog Talk Radio and YouTube. This show is one of the many ways I help equip individuals and teams to influence change at Enclaria. You can find more episodes like this one, plus additional resources to help you influence change at Enclaria.com. Today, my guest is Crystal Kadakia, who joins me also from Atlanta to discuss myths about millennials and how they impact workplace change. Crystal is a two-time TEDx speaker and expert on millennial behavior and digital workplace transformation. She is the founder of Invadi Consulting, where she works with leaders to shift mindsets on millennials and create organizational strategy. Her most recent book, The Millennial Myth, Transforming Misunderstanding into Workplace Breakthroughs, just came out this week. Crystal, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're listening. <laughs> wherever you're listening. Good day. And congratulations um, on the book launch. I'm excited for you. you. Thanks so much. I'm so excited. I'm excited to have a chance to share a little bit about um, the work I'm doing with you uh, today. Great. And I'd love to put it also in the context of change, since most of the people who are listening are implementing some kind of change. And I haven't had this conversation before on the show. And so I'm curious to hear about how different generations process and navigate change. But before we even go into that, why don't we just sort of level set on this whole generational thing? And you know, what are we even talking about? Yeah. So I think one of the things that really drives me crazy about um, perceptions we have in society right now about generations it's it's that we think generational science is kind of the end-all be-all telling us everything we need to know about what's going on in our workplace today and it's it's really not so a lot of times we'll look at um, generational traits and behaviors to tell us things about the population of employees that we're trying to engage and we kind of miss out on a whole other host of factors that's influencing them so, you know, we'd like to think that millennials, things we can assume about them are, you know, a lot of the things that I talk about in my book, being lazy, entitled, disloyal, and we start creating conclusions on what we can do in the workplace about that. So that's not really what Generations is all about. When you go back to generational science, it's all about really understanding the behavior uh, that of different generations based on events that they went through in their formative years. And what we, what sociologists assume is that because you went through some of those same formative events as a generational cohort, you may have similar values, attitudes, and behaviors. Now, the mistake we've all been making is we start to really assume the intention behind these observable behaviors. And that's where you start hearing things like, oh, well, boomers don't want to adapt to change. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> that's <laughs> And that's an assumption about an intention, which is, is not what science is supposed to, not what generational science is trying to tell us. So, um, you know, that's something for me that was the starting point of the philosophy behind the, the work I, I started doing five years ago on researching millennial behavior and what does that really tell us about the way that we work and live today. And it also has a cross-generational context as well. So what I would say is that what we're really talking about when it comes to generations is we need to stick to the science, not so much the um, assumptions about intention, and then really look at factors outside of just generations. Generations is just one data point to explain what's going on right now in the workplace. And not focusing on character as well. I'm part of that intent is also attributing it to people's character. Yeah, you exactly. In general. <laughs> it just, you know, person to person, and we all <laughs> are inevitably are going to make our own judgments, but that comes from a different place than generational science. Yeah. And, you know, I'm Gen X, like smack in the middle. So, you know, I always get forgotten anyway. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you know, it kind of is funny being, being Gen X and talking to Gen Xers because uh, what I always hear from Gen Xers is, well, they used to complain us, complain about us all the time, too, right. when we started. What are you guys complaining about? But then they're like, oh, but now we're the forgotten generation. Yeah, right. <laughs> sort of, a, well, which is it? Do you want us to talk about you or do you want us to forget about you? Neither. <laughs> <So. laughs> okay, so what are some of the myths about millennials? Yeah, so... 
So I think some of the, well, basically in my book, I cover five of the biggest myths. And these are often the, the stereotypes you hear of millennials are lazy, they're entitled, that in the nicer way that usually sounds like, oh, well, they're the trophy generation. Um, they were used to getting boards in school. Uh, they're disloyal. So that's where we're always talking about people changing jobs really quickly. Um, that they have authority issues that they're looking at everybody as their friend and not really necessarily having a sense of decorum towards hierarchy and um, just that they need feedback constantly. They're used to all the dings and, and likes and they want immediate kind of pats on the back. And so those are kind of some of the common myths we hear. And again, the, the reason why I call them myths or stereotypes is because you really were talking about intention and behavior instead of the actual feeling free to approach a leader uh, and, and not necessarily being afraid to approach a leader because they've been at the company for 20 years or something like that. So the, the, um, the behavior you're seeing is just, okay, approaching leaders. And what we take that to mean is you don't understand hierarchy. So there's, <laughs> right, those are the kinds of... But really, everybody else is just afraid to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Or maybe there's other reasons as well. But it's just, you don't know what's really going on until you ask. Okay. Motivations. So putting that into the context of change then, how do some of these myths show up when we're trying to influence change in millennials and, and, and anyone else? You know, what is it that, that people who are trying to implement change might do or maybe they, something they could do better when it comes to <laughs> trying to influence millennials. So here's one of the things that we know about change management, right, is there's always a resistance to change. <laughs> and we're always trying, as humans, we, we resist change. We kind of want to stick with the status quo. It's safe. But where we're at is that in the last three decades, we've seen so much change with digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And what's going on is that millennials grew up during that time, and they're really a reflection of all of those changes that have occurred. So um, most often when I'm working with leaders, what I hear is that millennials are the problem. We really need to figure out how to engage and retain them. And really, there's a deeper underlying issue that is really scary to address. And it's, whoa, digital transformation has happened. And we need to catch up in our workplace. And so um, we kind of have this, this, I'd like to call it a paradox of leadership right now. We say things like we want to attract the best and the brightest millennials. But then on the other hand, we're like, they're the cause of all of our problems. <laughs> so, so the first kind of piece around being able to change is really re realizing that there is this bias and openly admitting that there's a bias and there's a resistance to change. And the change is not really so much getting millennials to change to us or us to completely change to millennials. It's mm -hmm. figuring out together what does a workplace, what does an effective, productive, engaging workplace look like in, a, in the digital age? That's really the problem that we're trying to figure out. So the first step is really just acknowledging that there's this bias, this resistance, and this kind of deeper fear, and to step back from that and then really start questioning the behavior of everybody in this digital world. And it, that can be a generation independent inquiry. It doesn't have to be divided up into millennials, Gen Xers, boomers. It can help to look at it um, from the point of view that millennials are that first generation to grow up with internet, but also they're going to be the last generation to remember a world without it. So to me, millennials are that kind of pivotal generation where we sort of have a last chance to, to keep some of those status quo behaviors because when you yeah. interact with Gen Z, there's no memory of a, of a different time. And right. that's what, so to me, that having that line of inquiry as we're uh, thinking about digital transformation, instead of looking at millennials as the problem, really looking at them as a symptom of a bigger problem and a potential solution or, or, or a place of inquiry to understand. Okay. And as you were going through the different myths, one that stood out to me is uh, the disloyalty. 
as a myth, right? But part of the perception is, well, you know, if we try to implement this change and it doesn't go well, then this millennial is just going to abandon ship or that kind of attitude going in. And so I'm curious how you would turn that around to be more productive. Yeah. So I think if we're really authentic with our change efforts, we're going to start by getting insight from the folks that we want to retain, right? So if our change effort is oriented around retaining millennials, well, hopefully you're including millennials in figuring out um, how it is you, you want to change the culture or change a component um, of your workplace in order to retain these millennials. So I think one, by involving them in the change early on, which is true with any change effort, right? That's, right. that's an ideal step to take you're going to have greater success of potentially retaining them. And I think what really speaks to millennials is, is that, you know, they know that there's a way that's work, that work has been done for ages. They know that, you know, they're not, they're not coming into this with blinders on. I think the, the idea that a company cares about their opinion and cares to experiment and try some different approaches maybe it is going to fail. But the other cool thing about millennials is they grew up very much in this, uh, idea that startups are sexy and entrepreneurship is sexy when they see organizations taking that kind of attitude uh, to be honest it's i would say it's more of an attractor than a detractor so Um, wanting to change is something that yeah tend to be attracted to as long as i think it's something that you know is all changes as they're a part of it and, and I would say other generations are a part of it, right? Because right. I, I would say what's more, um, more scary or more of a potential is losing some of the long tenured folks you have because they think you're now trying to cater to millennials. Yeah. And I actually think that's probably a bigger issue than losing the millennials because you are trying to make a change. I think to them, you trying to make a change is such a positive thing. And for other folks, man, they're in the culture. They've been in the culture for a while and trying to change that's going to seem a, a little bit more threatening if you, if you don't involve them as well. Yeah. So what about for millennials who might be trying to implement change with people from all different generations in the workplace? What are the implications for them? How would you tell them to approach it? Yeah, I think... One of the behaviors with millennials, um, and especially with Gen Z, who, who haven't joined the workforce in droves yet, but we're getting there, yeah. but this, especially with these folks, there is, um, there is a behavior around immediacy. Uh, and and uh, that behavior is really not necessarily making the connection to the value of how long things truly can take. And so I think for millennials who are trying to influence change, there's, there's two things to really keep in mind. One is that there is a reason why things are the way they are. You should always strive to discover that reason <laughs> before going in with your, you know, it up. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and your immediacy approach of, well, okay, I want a solution right away. So let me give them a solution right away because you're going to miss out on understanding the journey and understanding the existing structure and culture. And people are complex. Google may not be complex. The answers you get off of a search engine may not be complex, but true change and and changing with people is a complex thing. Um, And that takes a level of experience to understand. And, um, and I think, you know, millennials, like I, I would say myself as well, right? You know, even starting a business, you might think, well, immediately you're going to be able to make this impact with executives. They're going to get it. <laughs> you need to understand no, that. <laughs> no, no, it takes time, right? You, it's, it's, a, it's a sweet struggle, <laughs> sometimes bittersweet, but it's, it's, a, it's well worth the journey. So I think that's definitely understanding why things are the way they are is an important part of it that, that I think millennials really need to pay attention to. And then the second piece is just, is just what I've said is that once you're, you've integrated why things are the way they are, realize that um, it is going to take time to implement a change and you are going to have to influence folks for, from across the board, laterally, laterally and vertically in, in your change. It's not going to happen just because you raise your hand once and 
and you did this, it's going to be hard. You're going to have to enroll stakeholders. That's, that's the way change happens. And that's not a, that's not a generational thing or a way it's always right. been done. That's a human, you know, that's a neurological thing. There's so much, I mean, you, you know this, Heather, there's so yeah. much involved <laughs> in change that's, that has nothing to do with digital or the internet. It's just how people right. work. Or even just how great the idea is. Yeah, exactly. And we, we all follow that pitfall of, well, I've got a great idea. Everyone's going to adopt it and see it, right? right? And it's like, no, <laughs> doesn't matter how old you are. That's really not how it works. We're going to do it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's dig into this concept of digital transformation a little bit more because I'm curious about what's your definition of that and how can we leverage the experience of millennials to sort of get that across the whole organization? Yeah, that's a huge question. Um, I think the simplest way for me to answer that is to say that our lives outside of work are right now very different from inside of work. There's digital tools we have that really um, have changed our lives, right? Everything from GPS to how we might shop, how we might look for answers to questions, how we process information, how we know what's going on in our communities, how we know what's going on with our friends. Every facet of our lives has, has in some way been touched by digital. When you look at the workplace, what we, what we see is it's not as easy to find that same kind of information or answers. It's not as easy, intuitive, or, or the same to build communities or share ideas or find ideas or um, surface new insights. Uh, it's maybe not as efficient, right? There are a lot of things that we, there's sort of this mismatch between our personal lives and our work lives. And, and, and that's the goal of digital transformation is to understand those gaps and what's meaningful and what's effective and productive to bring into the workplace. Because surely not everything that's going on in our personal lives from a digital standpoint is going to be effective. So for example, the the concept of fake news, right? That's a really big buzzword right now, fake news for a lot of reasons that we are not going to go into right now. (laughs) But that's a really big buzzword right now, right? (laughs) Well, fake news is not something that you want to bring into your organization. That would be one way that from a digital transformation standpoint, you want to be very strategic (laughs) about how you introduce news into your organization. But there may be other things such as um, how we surface insights, how there's so many different channels online for a subject you may be interested in and you might just be curious about. And, you know, you can go on Khan Academy or Coursera and take you know, random courses about it. You can ask your folks on Facebook or LinkedIn for for information and you get it, you know, you get it. You find it from a very diverse variety of sources. And that's something we really struggle with inside of companies is how do you surface innovation uh, using our global scale? So now to kind of connect it to millennials, um, millennials have grown up using these types of tools, Gen Z even more so. So, Whereas for an older generation, it may be uh, a, those tools may be looked at through a different filter, a filter of having lived through a time where you don't have those digital tools. For millennials, their experiences were, were shaped by using those digital tools. So um, again, I'll say millennials are that first generation to grow up with it and the last generation to remember a world without it. So the things that we like about how millennials are productive and effective those are clues for things we might want to think about changing in our organization. Some of the things they may complain about the most, um, maybe it's navigating our intranets, for example, maybe it's uh, intuitive user experiences. Those are the things we want to be like, maybe those are opportunities for our organization. Those aren't just complaints for the sake of complaints, but that's digital transformation experience that could be effective. Now things we see that are hindering millennials from being productive and being strategic, for example. So maybe information overload. There might be some things we're observing from millennials where it's like, you know, they're not, they're having a hard time really sorting through information. That again becomes the clue for things we need to do inside of our organizations. Maybe we need to help our employees 
sort through some of this information they're getting and, and prioritize what's important, what's not important. You know, what, what technology tools can we use to help folks with that? What leadership tools can we use to help folks help with that? What can our managers be uh, providing as guidance? What can our leaders be providing as guidance from a strategy and vision perspective to help people understand what to look at and what not to look at? And now that might, for example, that one might be something that that's been a problem for generations as well, right? Yeah, sure. We've always had information. The difference is the volume of information. Right. And at the end of the day, what's, what's going to help millennials is going to help the rest of the organization as well, um, because we're all dealing with digital transformation. Yeah, and what's coming to mind is that, you know, in, when we look at tra- digital from an outside of the workplace and an inside the workplace perspective, it, it just got me thinking and being curious about what is it that makes it so easy to adopt something outside of work and so difficult mm-hmm. inside work. and you know, outside work, it's, we, in some ways, we can make up our own rules about it. <laughs> you know, we can just try whatever we want. No one's going to make us do it. You know, my, my brother was one of the last people ever to join Facebook, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but he was fine with that, you know. But if you took that into the workplace and trying to get everybody to standardize on one thing, you know, the digital changes so fast, too. You know, outside of Facebook, you can look at all the different tools that are happening with uh, collaboration, like mm-hmm. Slack and Trello and all these other things. And you know, it's like a, there's a new one every week to try. So uh, I'm just thinking, you know, maybe there's this sense of experimentation or something that needs to happen within organizations where we just, let's try something and see what works. But I know, you know, depending on the organization, that's not always the culture. And sometimes that's frowned upon. So that's just something that, that came to mind. Yeah. No, I think that's a really, that's a really cool insight. And I think that's a really good, um, good train of thought. You know, it makes me, I I haven't thought enough into that direction, but when I look at what's been, um, what worked, right, how quickly Facebook was adopted, I think there is a point where um, you get a critical mass for something. So maybe it is a little bit of experimentation at the beginning um, and giving people choices of whether to join or not join or choose a few things, maybe pilot a few things. But then eventually, I think there is a point where a certain tool will have critical mass, such as using Microsoft Office, right? I mean, at some point, your organization's on it, and you're there. And I think even in our personal lives, once something is taking critical mass, we don't necessarily go out and constantly try the flavor of the week. And for those new startups, you know, that's, that's really hard. But Hey, that's marketing. Okay, that's happened again yeah. for centuries. Once you've got a main player in the, in the field, the barriers to entry become pretty high. So, I mean, for me, I'm not looking at every new social network every week. I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, and I this much on Twitter. Someone today asked me if I'm on Instagram. I'm like, no, I'm not an Insta Insta person, yeah. you know, whatever. But I could be, but I'm not. And it's just exactly what you said. It's personal choice, and some things have taken critical mass. Sure. Um, and not being able to do everything back to your previous point. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, so just to underline this whole conversation, what is it that you want people to take away as far as when they think of, of millennials and change and organizational effectiveness, you know, what is it that, that you want people to know? Yeah, I would say it comes down to a couple things. Um, One, I can't say this enough, millennials are a symptom of a larger underlying problem around digital transformation. Um, And I think that the more we recognize that, the closer we are to creating cross-generational engagement and um, really dealing with the challenges we have today of digital transformation, but also demographic shift. So, you know, the idea that we have all the, a lot of boomers who are going to be retiring in the next 10 years, we really need to develop effective knowledge transfer now, um, especially for the sake of Gen X, who are going to be leading these organizations. And, you know, they've got some big shoes to fill because there's not as many Gen Xers in the population as there are boomers. Um, so we've got a big demographic shift that's coming up and we need to be better prepared for it. So, you know, I'd say the biggest thing to take away is just that, you know, millennials are a symptom of this problem. The more we change our line of inquiry to understanding their behavior rather than complaining about it, <laughs> the more we're going we're gonna to shift towards that cross-generational 
digital transformation that, that we're really looking for. Um, and so I've got a copy right here. Nice this segue. Really good <laughs> step to doing that because what, what I do is really look at each of these, the five um, biggest myths and transform them, look at them from a traditional perspective and then look at them from a modern perspective and connect them to just a, a starting point for organizational changes that we could, we could think about instead. So really right. want to recommend it. I shameless plug for today. <laughs> <laughs> so like we said at the beginning, your book, the, the Millennial Myth came out earlier this week. And so where can people find that and where can they get in touch with you if they wanted to learn more? Yeah, uh, it's available on Amazon. If you prefer other retailers, it's on Barnes and Noble as well. Uh, Indie Bound, Books a Million. It's available in uh, many different countries in print. I believe a lot of countries in Europe. Um, and it's also available on Kindle and Audible around the globe. So anywhere you are, and I have actually found, this is just interesting to me, in terms of the global nature, um, there's a lot of countries who are facing a very similar millennial challenge in terms of the perception of millennials. They may not use the same words as lazy, entitled, so on, but the yeah. behaviors are the same. I just had an email from someone in Dubai telling me that this is perfect. Like this is exactly what she's experiencing. Wow. So I find that very, very, you know, rewarding for me, but you know, remarkable as well, because we've been looking for what's kind of that unifying sort of thing we can focus on given the diversity and the scale of our organizations. And this digital transformation thing has really affected um, so many people around the globe in similar ways in terms of immediacy, attention span, and so on. So anyway, so interesting. It's an American phenomenon. It's, it's yeah, really, it's, it's really a global, global phenomenon. Um, so that was totally a side note. But yeah, you can find it on Amazon. You can get in touch with me over LinkedIn. Um, that's probably the best way to reach me is, is through LinkedIn. Great. Well, Crystal, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, Heather. This is really fun and great, great questions on, on change and millennials. I love it. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for listening to the Influence Change at Work show. If you'd like to find more resources to help you influence change in your organization, including individual coaching, team workshops, and upcoming training events, please visit eclaria.com. And while you're there, sign up for the monthly newsletter and receive a free change readiness assessment to find out if your change initiative is set up for success. Until next time, best wishes on your change initiative.